And the pattern that I was continually seeing was these parent coaches, these parent coaches, and some had tennis experience and some didn't. Um, and I was like, why? <laughs> you know, like I asked the question, like, why? Why are parents having so much success? And granted, like there's a lot that don't. Like I'm not saying all parents need to get out there and start coaching. But when you look at the pros, there are so many like parent coaches active or parents that assisted along the way. Yeah, heavily involved like, along the way. Yeah, and it came back to me as this, this trust piece because a kid in a weird way, like, and parents openly admit like they care more about their kid than themselves. Like, and, and so credibility, they may not have necessarily an experience, but they're actually strong. Hello, Matthew Stevens. We <laughs> We're here. This guy is uh, really hard to get a hold of. He is not he here in the country very often. So when we can, we try to grab him with two hands and just hold him tight because, yeah, the opportunities are few and far between. So you have a big and strong tennis background. You played super intense as a kid. You, um, you lived and breathed it. To play Div 1 College, State League of 13, played stop, top of State League here for many years, a couple of State League Grand Finals, couldn't get over the line. And uh, you've been a massive pillar and influ influence for me. I feel like I've become a much better coach through like almost doing the uh, internship through just following your journey and, and asking you heaps of questions, picking your brains, um, because I feel like you have just an absolute love for the game and um you've just been someone that's just been open to learning and growing through the journey that you've been on so it's been helpful for me to follow in those footsteps and learn from what you've been doing and then take on that use it for myself and apply it in my own way which has helped me b become a much better tennis coach through my own experiences as well so i'm super keen and curious to know about how did your coaching journey start um and what made you transition from being a player to then a coach yeah um <laughs> well i'll probably take it back to when i was 14 and so uh my first ever job i was a hitting partner and uh, i was a, a paid hitting partner and when you get paid you uh, sometimes feel like you have to speak, <laughs> you have to help, you have to talk. And even though my role was a hitter, I started helping. And uh, I really liked the the way I could impact a player. I felt it even from then. I was like, I'm having a, a positive effect here. So I felt I was. Um, so it probably started then at 14 was my kind of, it was kind of my first job. <laughs> And it's really stayed that way ever since. Um, so, I mean, there's been many, uh, I guess, coaching practices that I've been involved in. I've worked for a lot of people, particularly when I was young. Um, but coaching started uh, as a hitter. And then I found a passion for it. Um, through honing my craft and actually realizing I was probably okay at it. Mm. And then that actually drove my passion further. So it was like I got into something and I was like just doing it. And then I started to realize I was okay at it and it made me want to become better at it. Mm. And that kind of, I guess, is drove uh, my journey and pursuit yeah, into well, coaching. When did you start to realize that? When did you start to go, hang on a minute, I'm actually doing okay this this is this is maybe leading somewhere um oh from a pretty early age yeah even when i was coaching at you know 18 19 20 because it was always a part-time job there as, as i was trying to play or was at college or was coaching summer breaks or um yeah so i was always uh doing a lot of it and i was finding that i was having reasonable success and and success is really only judged by players improving mm -hmm. 
or players coming back and wanting more. You know, so if you're doing a lesson, then the next minute they're like, I want to do another one. You kind of know you're doing something right there just from like a, a relationship point of view. You know what I mean? Like it's like they want to go again. So that was probably like my first inclination of going, I think I'm okay at this. Um, and yeah, that really drove the thirst to to become a, a coach. Yeah. Mm. Were there any... Um pivotal moments that started to catapult it in a new direction the way you maybe learned from someone or made like a commitment to go well i'm going to take this to the next level where i'm not going to work for anyone i'm actually going to start something for myself uh yeah i'll, I'll probably re rewind back to college so there was a, a u.s summer i was i was going to come home and uh one of the guys on my team um it was fernando gonzalez's cousin so he was he was on my team and he was he was just a real funny lad like and he um he was like what are you what are you doing going home like he's like you you need to come to harvard um with me and the guys and uh do a coaching internship there he's like you it's harvard like it'll be on your cv for the rest of your life and i was like yeah i guess i'll do that like i didn't really know what it, what it all meant um and that that was my first serious intro into i guess formally learning biomechanics so that that threw me into like whoa okay now i'm uh, i'm learning how to formally teach strokes mm. um and i i loved it i enjoyed it didn't think too much of it kind of left it there left it there didn't really revisit it and still coached a lot since that and then that drove me um so I was just coaching, playing, doing like part-time stuff, finishing off uni. So I was just kind of, it was really just complementing my life coaching at that point. Um, and then as I was finishing my degree, I realized uh, that I wanted a coach and a, a mentor of mine, um, he used to coach me a little bit. It was a, a guy called Graham Neville. Uh, he kind of said, um, I mentioned that I wanted to go to Brisbane um, and coach at an academy and he was like, that is, he's like, you learn so much. So at that point, I, I moved to Brisbane to take on a coaching position, which is pretty like full on really. When I look back at it, at the time, I didn't think much of it. But when I look back, I was like, I actually moved <laughs> to Brisbane for that. Like, wow. Um, yeah, I remember that time. <laughs> you just picked up and left, just out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, um, moved to Brisbane. And that's where I actually learned like, the commercial side of running a tennis academy um, because uh, I was in, and this is, I think, uh, another little kind of advice I would give to younger people is it's a great opportunity to work in a small business, a fast growth startup, something where you're actually really close to the founders and you can see everything that's going on because when you're working in a really big kind of bureaucratic um, business. There's so many divisions and you've got no idea what that division's talking about or that room's talking about or that department, you've got no idea. Whereas I was right in the in the main office with the, the founder, I was coaching the squad with the founder. Um, and so I just learned so much, like hands-on of like how to run a tennis academy. Um, and so I, I did that and, and learned a lot and then came back um, and in that time, there was an opportunity where uh, a club came up and yeah, it was Colin Grove. <laughs> and um, really what's, what drove me to start this business was uh, my experience at Harvard and my experience in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and combining those two is really the, the birth of what we have now <laughs> mm, that's really cool this is just a quick note on our podcast sponsor this podcast would not be possible without the support from 4rt they are a creative house that helps businesses with their advertising marketing and content needs if your business has a story to tell then these guys can really help you with that story and through ata they've helped us massively and we trust these guys dearly and we feel like they're the best in the business so they could add a lot of value to your marketing and advertising needs yeah, I think you've got the best of both there. I mean, you learned some really valuable things from Harvard. Like uh, you really 
learning from Steve Smith. Is that right? Yep. Was it from him himself? Him, yeah. Yeah. And what sort of things were you learning from him in terms of biomechanics of the strokes? Well, he, yeah, he really uh, believed in, I guess, the physics of stroke production. He, he wanted to obey physical laws. Um, and it was all about just building a great base. Mm. You didn't want to, uh, I guess, in his philosophy was like a lot can go wrong early. And so it's very important to to get a nice solid foundation and and set strokes up to succeed at a high level mm. and that's really simplicity yeah yeah i think that's really important that's one thing that you've been being on from the start and really i guess i think i've gone a lot more in that direction to make sure that you're laying the foundation to the best of your ability and and having almost like too much structure at the start like a lot of structure yeah. in in when working with younger children and building their base and then from there i guess breaking that mold and breaking that structure a little bit later on and being a little bit more fluid with the strokes mm -hmm. but that base will then set you up for a lot more success to then withstand the the speed of the game that rises quite quickly as you get older mm -hmm. i think biomechanics is a really interesting uh topic in itself I think it's important that you go down a biomechanics kind of rabbit hole mm -hmm. and and really go like, well, what is going on here from a science, physics point of view? Mm -hmm. But you've got to be able to synthesize it and explain it really simply. Yeah. So I think you can go too far into the biomech, but if you can't explain it simply to a kid that's learning well, then you've gone too far. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a there's a evolution there in learning biomechanics is you probably don't know much, and then you've got you've got to go in a lot and not find out a lot about it, and then come back simply mm -hmm. and be able to explain it really efficiently. Yeah. Did you go massively in that direction with biomechanics early on? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, how did, did that affect your coaching at that time? Um. Well, you, I can't say it affected it negatively um, from any like, oh, like I, I spent too much time on biomech, but we got to, I mean, the game's fast, it's complex, and I probably started to appreciate the individual, individual traits that athletes bring mm -hmm. to a solid base, which is kind of what you were talking about before, mm -hmm. was that I was maybe getting a little too cookie cutter yeah. like it's got to look like this it's got to look like this and yeah. and i've definitely become more open-minded and said like kind of mm. yeah yeah i think you can that, that's definitely a trap in itself i mean great base who you talked about so steve smith from great base we use a lot of their principles um as a guide and framework for mm -hmm. some of our stro stroke teaching i feel like almost there go a little bit very rigid in their stroke production has to be this way, very rigid and all precise. Everyone kind of looks the same. And I guess there's pros and cons to both sides, but you can almost yeah. be like, where's where's the balance there with that? Extremely rigid. And I, I would uh, I would encourage anyone listening to go have a look at his content mm -hmm. um, and, and dive into it because I, I still think it's some of the best out there. Yeah, I think it's awesome. Yeah, like, I've learned so much from yeah. it. Um, but when you're, when you're looking at it, and you're and you're dissecting it um i would say don't think that's how you're going to come out the other end i think you t you can extract the principles i just i like the principles that he teaches yeah i um, think with all of this stuff the principles are key it's not getting too stuck in it has to be looking this way correct it's just what are the physics what's the physics behind this stuff and how do you extract these principles to actually hit a good efficient ball off every single stroke yeah yeah where, where did this lead so you you basically got all that learning and then you went to brisbane what were some of the key takeaways you touched on it before about learning the, the commercial side but how did you really extract what you learned there to then make the decision and then implement it when you started your business and the building blocks of ata yeah so i was actually telling the guy i was working with in brisbane i was like man you've got to start one of these in Adelaide. And he was like looking at me like, what do you mean? I was like, you'd kill it. 
<laughs> I said that to him. I was like, if you take what you're doing here and you move it to Adelaide, I said, like, the market is crying out for it. <laughs> like, I know it'll work. And he kind of was like, oh, interesting. Like, didn't really... It was just more like a, oh, like, thanks for the comment type thing. Like, thanks for the... Yeah. Um, and then so... Uh, I guess I always believed uh, in that structure and that setup and that that the way they had that academy running. I thought I, I knew it was going to work um, here. I never thought I was going to start it here necessarily. Um, but yeah, there was a, a, a sliding doors moment where um, a mate I was actually coaching at the time he sent me an email and he said you got to you, you got to apply for this club. Um, and at the time, I, I wasn't even Tennis Australia qualified. And the club was down the road from where I lived, like literally down the road. I could, I could walk there. And I drove past the club every night wondering, like, who's coaching there? Like, I didn't even know who was there. Um, and, yeah, I, long story short, I, uh, I, I went for this uh, club and landed it. And it's next door to another club. And I'm not sure if that was a, a turnoff for many coaches, like, you know, it was a big club next door and, um, but somehow, uh, yeah, the, the club kind of became mine. Mm. Um, and then I was free to, to start a business there. And, and that was like, all right, how does this look? Yeah. Yeah. That would have been a crazy time. Super just like, I have no idea what's going to happen here, but I've got a club and yeah, let, let's kind of go where did where did the name Adelaide Tennis Academy come from why yeah <laughs> why that I mean. well I was kind of I mean an R and I was like I just had no idea what to call it I was over complicating things like with these names and and getting too far-fetched and uh my girlfriend at the time was kind of like why don't why don't you just call it Adelaide Tennis Academy <laughs> and I was like nah I was like that's I was like that's that name's taken like I can't I can't call it that. Um, and she said, well, just look it up. Like, check if it is. And I looked and I was like, it's not taken. So like literally in that moment, I was like, bang, registered. And then like domain name, registered. Like multiple domain names, like adelaidetennis.com.au, registered. Like boom, boom, adelaidetennis.com.au, registered. I just went like everything. Um, and that, the name... Uh, it wasn't all uh, it had its it had its downsides too at the time um yeah <laughs> in what way um well it, it put a massive layer of accountability on me to actually go like whoa like oh, this is nothing i've literally got no business here and i've called it adelaide tennis academy and it was like i've actually got to make this work like this has to be a success like that in my mind there was no other alternative in my mind like I was hell-bent on making this work um and really vulnerability and in uh being insecure about it was the fuel mm. like that was the that was the fire that was what actually like and it's an interesting um point there is uh we all have things we're dealing with. We all have these little doubts or insecurities or, or fuels. Um, and if we don't use them, well, they kind of use us. But at, at that point in time in my life, I was able to, to push it into something. Mm. Um, and I really think that's one of the major reasons why I was able to get things moving. Like it was a lot of luck. I mean, a lot of things fall, fell into place. Like when I, you know, think back at it, a lot of luck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's nothing like having a lofty dream and goal like that to fuel a fire to go, well, I've set myself up here. I'm a target now. I've, I've named this name in Adelaide with no business here. There's literally no one on the courts. Yep. I have <laughs> to do something now because yeah. <laughs> I look like an idiot if that I don't. <laughs> That was, that was, uh, well, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely a strong feeling at the time. Yeah. But it, 
but I didn't have much time to think because I just started working. Yeah. <laughs> what was um, that initial phase like, that first one to two years of just head down and work? What do you remember? What was it like? What were you learning? Well, the first year I had, I just thought in the first year the business was going to be huge. I literally thought, like, I thought after the first year it was going to be like just pumping. And um, yeah, no, it, it wasn't. Yep. Yeah. It, it, despite my best efforts, it was, um, it was growing and it was giving me like reason to believe this could be a really good thing. But it wasn't where I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that definitely speaks to something that I'm really passionate about now is this idea of like um, patience in the long term and um, like real focus in the short term. Mm -hmm. Like daily, like just putting following process, working hard. Uh, doing the right things on a daily basis um, but being extremely patient looking out mm. into the future and yeah it's it's something that I guess I believe in because I've had proof of concept <laughs> yep. when you've had when you've done something and you've seen it work you go ah oh, that makes sense <laughs> yeah yeah I mean it's something that a lot of people are struggling with in my generation, our generation and younger that they just believe that everything, click your fingers here now, let me just go from job to job, yep. kind of trying to weasel my way through opportunities and try to get rich real quick. And it's uh, for anyone who wants to start a business, it, it is a lot of what you're saying. Uh, we have these big expectations that things are just going to blow up and, you think you realize pretty quickly that's not not the case and yeah it's just honestly as simple as daily energy to what you're doing mm -hmm. and don't stop just keep going yeah and keep making sure that your intentions are in the right place and the vision that you're heading towards is something that you actually really want because if you start moving in that direction you realize you don't want it then of course at some point it's going to break down mm -hmm. So you just basically knew that this was what you really wanted and you were just relentless towards working at it. Did, in that first year, did you start to go, yeah, well, this is, I'm really loving this and I really want to keep going in this, in this direction? Yeah. Yeah, like I, um, like I mentioned before, I was, it was growing. I was having success with players. I was, uh, new players were coming in. I, I was building good relationships. Mm. Um with a lot of young athletes I, and I, and I made a point early to start. Um, I wanted to actually build and develop players. Mm. Um, and so I say that more out of the fact that like when you come from a little bit of a playing background, not that I was a, an unreal player, but when you have a, have a playing background and you can hit, um, you can start coaching better players because good players, uh, or, or you know 14 15 16 year olds they want to hit the ball around um, I didn't really want to do that mm. so I didn't th that was not a priority at all for me starting out it was like, I actually want the eight-year-old I want the nine-year-old I want the the ten-year-old that I can that I can build and make a difference too early and and I guess impart my own philosophies and my beliefs and my knowledge mm. into that into something that was building um so i definitely took it i feel like a a longer term approach to, to even starting out because mm -hmm. I, I didn't i didn't want to like recruit players i actually wanted to like develop and coach players yeah that, that, that's a tricky one i find that one a little bit hard i i prefer working with someone if i can from from the beginning um or someone that has less experience and you can really uh, shape with a very nice foundation like we've been talking about before like having that having that foundation where you can set that it's going to be efficient to handle the pace increase as they get better because mm -hmm. I found it actually really challenging working with players that are already established um, I'm not sure if it's the same for you but it's like they come through and had been doing t a few things technically for quite a while and been having already like a number of different voices in their ear and it's it's i find it really hard to actually 
make change and you basically got to just almost accept what's going on there and it's hard to almost pivot and change in different directions sometimes mm -hmm. how, how do you go with that balance i mean how do you go with working with someone just say they already come to you as a player how would you coach them differently to maybe someone that you're working with from from like an eight nine ten year old standpoint yeah interesting i i think it's about really knowing your athlete and really knowing uh, their identity, their why, their, their like, why do they play, um, and and try and delve into the, the deeper things rather than just because I think we we get a player and we like see something and we're like I got to change that, and then you start talking to them and they're like, "What's my best shot?" <laughs> and we were going to change it <laughs> and, and things like that. So I think you got to really understand. The player how they want to play their game style what are they what are they trying to do uh to win points um and i say win points that's a that's a probably separate topic <laughs> but um i'm big on the language around that like in terms of say uh, how an athlete is trying to win a point um like for example, I would if someone was like, "Oh, I, I wait for the opponent to miss," I would like reframe that into, uh, "I outwork my opponent," or "I put my opponent in difficult positions and frustrate him and draw an error," like rather than wait for him to miss because I feel like that's really like negative type passive. Yeah, it's real passive language. Yeah, passive language. So I still think like in in terms of same concept almost, but it's the you're being proactive in your in how you win points not yeah yeah exactly i mean that's something that i feel you've been big on from the the, the length of time that i've known you is you've always been someone that no i guess steers someone in a game style based on their attributes their physicality and who they are as an individual is that something that you picked up pretty early on when did you start to make that pivot to go well this is kind of who they are as a person and we need to go in this direction because i feel like a lot of coaches maybe fall into the trap of just teaching their own biases of what they know and what they think works best all of the time but it's not as simple as that yeah i think an often underlooked aspect to game style is actually personality mm. <laughs> because uh, we look at the physical attributes and we're like oh he's, he can do this or she can do that or she's going to be quick or um, all these things but you've actually got to know like in how are they going to play under pressure are they going to take it on or are they going to sit back in their shell so you could be teaching a really kind of aggressive type game style but that athlete when 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 like things get real is actually going to go into their shell a bit so you, yeah for me it's like really try and understand like how does how does this athlete really want to play and particularly how do they naturally play under pressure mm. like even from an early age like i want to see how they take on the big points mm. yeah yeah that can really shape things i think that's made coaching a lot more fun for me in the last maybe three four years mm -hmm where basically I see someone and what their attributes are, their personality, and then I coach in a way that is more aligned with that. Mm -hmm. And then it just keeps it different. It keeps it exciting. I feel like um, no, no two days are the same. Yep. I feel like with this play, I'm doing a bit of this and this play, I'm doing this and we're heading in this direction. And it's like to the outside, it's like you're doing the same thing every day, but I feel like I'm doing different mm -hmm. things all of the time and it keeps it exciting exciting and fresh yep <laughs> so, same for you in that way like did you love teaching the game in different ways in terms of like more feel or more creativity for this person who is more aligned in that way and well, more big bash come in come to the net kind of stuff with bigger athletes yeah i mean in the beginning particularly like a young athlete uh, i think education is it like is front and center so like i want to i want to teach this player this young player uh all the strokes because mm -hmm. i don't know what he or she may excel at i i got really no idea so i, I feel like i want to teach them all the strokes 
um, to give them good base. <laughs> um, and from there, because I, I, I mentioned obviously knowing your athlete, but I think that can be too, you can go in too early on that. I think when a, when a, when a young kid walks into your club or your centre and you're coaching them early, your role is just to teach them tennis and you need to teach them good strokes. That's what the parents bring in them, uh, bring in their child there for. And then as that evolves, you start to pick up the little pieces along the way. Like, oh, I think they respond to this better or they learn this way better mm -hmm. or I think they're going to be more inclined to this game style. But it's, a, it's, a, it's never static. Mm -hmm. I, look at, I look at athlete development as like a greenhouse you, you've got to control so many factors like um you know just like a greenhouse you've got the humidity the temperature the lighting there's so many factors at play but it's constantly changing and and you've got to uh, move through it with the athlete and i think we do a very poor job at times on undermining a young athlete's program in that moment so like We've got to understand that for the kid and the parent at 11 years old, that's super important to them. Mm. Like they, they, they want everything right. Yeah. <laughs> but we're like, oh, no, it doesn't matter. You'll be, you'll be good when you're 18. Like we're just kind of like – but like in that moment, it's really, really important like to get that right and then move it right, <laughs> like evolve it right. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, uh, big on education at the, at the forefront of a development model. Like that's that's the first thing I'm going to is like I want to teach this kid tennis. Mm, that's yeah, that's just going to give them such a good toolkit moving forward in the long haul mm -hmm. to be able to do so many different things. I mean, you touched on kind of like knowing the athlete to figure out when to maybe be um, more of a listener, when to maybe be a little bit harder, when to um, I guess be a little bit more funny or jovial when. Um, is that is that like the art of coaching to you? How how do you kind of navigate and feel the temperature of of what to kind of give and and the tone to coach from? Because that's something that is really challenging yeah. to find. Yeah, um, building a very uh, stable, strong relationship with your athlete, then versus maintaining the highest of standards is a very tricky, delicate approach mm -hmm. because uh, you balance, you, I guess you're balancing friendship in, in some cases um, with this idea of uh, if you don't do this, you're not going to get better. And yes, it's tough now. Yes, I'm being hard. Uh, yes, this is direct or yes, this is confronting. Um, it's a very, very difficult um, balance, but it really hinges. Coaching really hinges on what I call trust, and I've and um, I've kind of delved into this topic a little bit more. And trust, there's really four factors that create trust, and the the two principles that we we look at um, are actually not as valuable as what we think. And we look at, so when we try and build trust, it's like one is credibility. So my experience, my qualifications, all this, that's what that's one component that sits, say, up here, credibility. Then you've got reliability, meets deadlines, always there, um, gives, you the, gives you the time that you thought you were going to get. This is what they say they're yep. going to do. Yes, yep. Then there's this component of intimacy, mm -hmm. which is like he actually understands my values, he understands me a bit more as a person, mm -hmm. and that's a lot more important than the other two, then the credibility and reliability, the intimacy piece is more important. But there's a fourth piece that is actually even more important than the that intimacy piece, and that's what you call self orientation. And in that in that component, it's actually about uh, not yourself, but the athlete you're coaching. So when the athlete feels it's like he actually almost cares more about me than himself, it it's a big shift and so because I, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole where i started to study like player development journeys mm -hmm. and there was this, this pattern that i was continually seeing 
And the pattern that I was continually seeing was these parent coaches, these parent coaches, and some had tennis experience and some didn't. Um, and I was like, why? <laughs> you know, like I'll ask the question, like, why? Why are parents having so much success? And granted, like there's a lot that don't. Like I'm not saying all parents need to get out there and start coaching. But when you look at the pros, there are so many like parent coaches active or parents that assisted along the way. Yeah, heavily involved like, along the way. Yeah, and it came back to me as this, this trust piece because a kid in a weird way, like, and parents openly admit like they care more about their kid than themselves. Like, and, and so credibility, they may not have necessarily an experience, but they're actually stronger in the other areas. And I definitely think like that research or that my interest in that has definitely paved the, the, or contributed to the coach that I am. And the, even the, the philosophy we've got at ATA, I I feel like it's, it's built on a lot of care, a lot of passion, a lot of trust. Um, and but trust is only built over time um, through that formula that I was kind of mm. just breaking down. Yeah, that's really interesting and makes a lot of sense from my observations. What um what are you seeing with some of these successful parent models? What do you feel um, they're doing better to help some of these athletes to go to the top end? Well, I think they can be honest with them. Mm. Yeah, I think they can be really honest because it's a it it's not like a it the athlete knows that the parent truly cares for them. So it it's not yeah, I mean I think it sucks at times for a lot of athletes to hear it, but yeah, we were with the boy at um the Nadal Academy. He was an, he's an Australian like top player, like 300 in the world, 19-year-old, like he's flying. And um he's coached by his dad. And his dad was openly telling me started coaching him at two and he and he learned off youtube learned off youtube mm. yeah um and but just watching that was like it was so like we were on the court like jonas and, and me were on the court with him and it was like um it was real like the conversation like when he told him that like don't do this or do do that it was met with real emotion like like it meant something like every practice was important and the, the the dad was was really just telling him the truth and and the truth hurts sometimes you know like it hurts but um it was just seeing i guess that that realness that passion how much how much care there is in in what they're doing and it's really driving them to where the, where they are and like i said he's on track mm -hmm. he's got he he's on track to yeah. be top 100 player this kid um so yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I think having that base to just be honest and it does get really real, man. You can you can see in that environment that far out, it's it's going to hurt at times and they're going to have some brawls, but you can feel the energy that they're both driving it forward and they both really want to go somewhere and that's healthy. Yeah. That's healthy. I mean, it's, you don't want it to get out of control, but to for it to be honest and for them to actually like both know that they're on the same journey together heading there is that's sick. And I'm um, at a national event that I went to, I met this really, really good dad that um, was coaching his daughter. They were from New South Wales, I think, near Sydney. And, uh, yeah, he just took it upon himself to basically um, take the reins, I think, from her when she was maybe like 10 years old yep. and been working with her for the last three years, I reckon. And he just talked about it so passionately. He was just obsessed with learning obsessed with getting on youtube and doing his research obsessed with looking at who's doing the best things and um they had such a good relationship and it was really good to see how it can be done in a positive way when they're driving that process themselves and she knew that he was there for her and um they talked about the bad times as well and that it's it's a uh, really emotional and hard for him to deal with at times as a parent and it's a really high pressure job to find that relationship with being a dad or a mum in another instance and also being 
the coach and balancing that relationships like even harder than what we do as just like the coach yeah. player relationship i think it can end badly if it's not meant uh if it's not dealt with a lot of care and obviously we've seen in another circumstance with like yelena dockage for example it's yeah. like it's it's really sad yeah really sad that she's been through some of those things and how tumultuous and terrible it was and how it can on the flip side be really really managed poorly yeah 100 percent. like I, I i can't say i'm necessarily advocating for parent coaches i i'm probably more just commenting on the patterns the data mm. the the uh because i uh, i i'm about uh numbers <laughs> and and uh, statistics and when you see something that's so prevalent and so successful like i said it, it drove me to ask the question well why mm. uh, why 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 is that working so so often on top but yeah this there are so many that don't <laughs> yeah yeah um where's the balance with art versus science i mean the science behind the game and the physics and um the i guess the game style the numbers the statistics behind winning percentages etc and then also like the art form behind it how do you float between and and what's what's the balance there do you think yeah touched on the biomechanics like dive into it like go study it go go learn as much as you want if you're a really passionate coach or, or passionate parent and you're really trying to help your kid come out the other side simplify it synthesize the key points that you can communicate it clearly because you don't really know your subject matter if you cannot communicate it to a, a young kid that doesn't know much about the game mm-hmm. so uh that's where i would go from the and when I, when you talk about science I, I think biomechanics like that's what i lead to but there are there's a lot more data around tactics and and things like that which we can kind of get to but um simplifying the biomechanics um and then building the trust piece for me, mm-hmm. building the trust piece um, in that because coaching is a human relationship. Yeah. So I think we get confused with teaching and coaching. I think they're different things. Mm-hmm. Um, teaching is the ability to transfer the info. Like I, I want to teach teach you this. Coaching is more like guiding mm-hmm. for me. Like so, they're different. Yeah, very very very, very different. Um, and it's an evolving piece like it's an evolving piece I, I, in terms of development as well um but then coaching on the road and coaching on the tour like they're different they're completely different roles they're, they're different they're not the same job <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how is that difference what are you observing because you've been on the road a fair bit what, what's it like and what are you observing with coaches that are taking more of that path um well, how much when you're on the road and I guess you're on tour, let's say, um, how much less you say? Like, you're just saying so, so little, but just being there, watching, listening, all these, are like, I would call like observation skills, because you've actually got to be there when the athlete's like, oh, did you see that? And you've got to go, yeah, 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 you did this, this, and this. And they're like, oh, yeah, he was watching. <laughs> You know, versus like always feeling like you have to be the guy to like jump in and tell them. Mm-hmm. It's more like you've got to be like always watching and ready when they need you. Yeah, yeah. there's a point. There's a point with every athlete that that starts to shift into that mode, um, even if you're not a traveling coach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and there is a there is a I think when they start to go through puberty or they start to become like their own individual mm-hmm. and they're making more autonomous decisions behind the process. You can feel that shift, and you kind of gotta you, you kind of gotta roll with it mm-hmm. to be like, okay, well now this person, I need to kind of just be there. I need to say less. I need to kind of just ask them how they felt about this, and really let them drive the process a little bit more rather than me driving it or kind of guiding more. Because um, in initial stages, of course, when you're building the base, it needs to be a lot more like that. But yeah, yeah with every player. It's almost like you need to kind of feel the temperature of when that shift is happening. It happens at different ages. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I, I was going to add, um, I love video as a conversation starter. Mm-hmm. So like I'll, 
like even if you're doing something on technique or you're filming the way they play a point or anything really on the video it's almost like what do you think like like you you tell me because a lot of the times they have the right answer or they're like oh like i look like that <laughs> or, I'm, or i didn't do this or i didn't do like they know yeah. so sometimes like rather than actually coming with such like we want to almost like when we're coaching and we're trying to make an impact we like want to do it right away but we actually don't get through <laughs> so it's been ineffective so like I find like and every athlete different, but video video is a conversation starter, not not as video as like you need like I've got it all what you need to do. I'm talking just what do you think? Like tell me. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a really good way to just let them come to to the consensus themselves. Basically, yeah. they just like figure out and go, wow, like oh, it's right there in front of me. I can I can clearly see yeah. what what's going on. I can clearly see oh, I'm not doing this. I'm doing this and they tell you yeah. rather than you telling them. I think that's an important point to basically let the athlete come up with the answer themselves to feel like they're yeah. learning it themselves. They're driving this. Mm. They're, they're, they particularly, and I'm pretty big on like in, there's all these coaching approaches, direct, indirect, but I just think when it starts out and, and Dylan can probably speak to this, <laughs> but um, when a kid's learning at 10 years old, like, I'm the coach. I'm going to tell you how to do it. Like it's, it's pretty direct. Like I just remember when I was coaching Joan, like I'm telling him how to hit the ball. Like there's no, like he's not sat telling me like, Oh, I think I should do this in my technique. He's 10. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like he's, he wants to learn the game. He's young, he's learning. Um, but it definitely shifts. Like it, it goes from a very direct coaching style and it's that needle that, or that percentage of direct indirect is moving towards indirect. Mm -hmm. It's not very direct. Like, and it should be that way because it should be athlete driven by the time they they get to it as they get older. It shouldn't be coach driven. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've been around a bunch of academies. I mean, you spent only a little bit of time at Motoglis, but you spent a lot more time at um, the Rafa Nadal Academy. Um, I mean, aside from the obvious, I mean, the facilities are out of control. I mean, yep. that's what makes it amazing as well. But what's actually going on and what's like the fundamental structure of why there is success there? Philosophy. <laughs> what is that philosophy? Yeah, philosophy and clear identity. So um, you walk into the place and you feel like when you're watching court to court, it's consistent. So I think that's a big thing when you look at a program. It's not like different everywhere. It's consistent. Um, but a couple of things that really stand out is um, enduring suffering. Like you got to love suffering. You got to like not even, yeah, enduring is the wrong word. Like love it. Like love hurting. <laughs> love the pain. Like that's definitely embedded into their philosophy. Um, you, you can't miss the same ball twice. Like really, once again, really basic. But like, if you miss a forehand cross, it's like boom, ball. All of a sudden, the ball's been fed in, and you got to hit another forehand cross. And if you miss that, like again, like get it right. <laughs> um, so a lot of uh, you know, reps, reps high, and and then the volume is just so volume and intensity. I mean, is just next level, really. I mean, we. Players here will, will come and they'll warm up and they'll they'll play a set, maybe a little bit more and pack it up. Whereas like at the Dales, it was like they'd already been training two and a half hours, three hours. And I was like, oh, yeah, I think we got time to fit a set in. Like we'll play a match now after like two and a half hours training. Do you know what I mean? Like that was just like, what do you mean? Like we've got half an hour to fill. Like we're not going to, they're yeah. not going to waste it. Whereas we'll just go home, we'll warm up, play a set, 45 minutes, oh, feeling pretty good, and then go home. Yeah. Is that the biggest difference that you feel is happening over in Europe compared to here? Because it's you, you're right, it's, that's definitely what's happening. Well, the here. Vo volume, yeah, the volume and the intensity is one thing that stands out, and clearly it's the, the, the hunger. Yeah. Like going to a, when you play a tournament in Australia, it's there's just no shortage of a, of a practice court or a warm-up court, there's courts everywhere, you take it for granted. Whereas over there, it's like, 
you just like you can't even get on a court and if there is you're always sharing a court you're always trying to hustle a half hour here or a court over there whereas here where you just set your time and rock up and the court's free do you know what i mean so there's a very different philosophy around it i mean there was even these kids in europe uh they played this doubles match they they won the doubles match like pretty easily and shook hands and then like quickly ran down the opposite ends to fit in five minutes of hit in portugal before the next match came on the court because they were like they just was like there's a court free for five minutes and that doubles was pretty easy so like i gotta hit some balls like probably get ready for tomorrow or like any ball they can hit that yeah yeah that mindset that mindset takes you places yeah, yeah. underpinned by you got to love the hard work yeah. which is i guess the suffering and the element that you're talking about at raffers and um the discipline element of not missing the same stuff over and over yeah. again like just boom those embedded into the training consistently maximizing every minute doesn't matter if you continue on the tennis path you're going to be you're going to be rocking yeah. in other areas that's that's awesome life skills the- there's just, I mean, on top of the, the things that they get right, um, there's just good players everywhere. Yeah. Like you look around and you look, just, he can whoop your ass. <laughs> and then that guy can whoop his ass. <laughs> and it, it, I mean, it stems from when you have Rafa training there. Mm-hmm. So, and then think, like, okay, so Rafa's training there and then just work your way down. Yeah. So every time we've been there, there's been pros, mm-hmm. Carrot Serve, Benoit Puer. Mm-hmm. on top and then you filter in the guys that are 300 400 like lots of them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um so it, the yeah. culture there just through who's there like is driving an intensity that is unrivaled mm-hmm. really yeah that's yeah. a big one yeah i mean even on such a small scale when we've had nights we've had really good players um, local players playing at our courts and then you see all of the other young kids that are just like trying to aspire to be at the higher level. You can see the intensity that filters down the courts mm-hmm. from the top court all the way down to the bottom. And you can just feel there's just like an energy. There's a hunger. Yeah. I think yeah, everyone kind of strives to work their way up. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a really inspiring environment to be around. Yeah. Natural too. Mm. Yeah. Not, not, not no forced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just, it just it's is the best. Cause you yeah. look a little bit silly. If yeah. You're yeah, yeah. Training. Yes. Cause you got these guys. On yes. The that are absolutely. Just like bringing absolute hustle and intensity to their practice. And you're over here just kind of missing balls in the net every, every couple. And it's just like, you can't be here anymore. You don't belong here anymore. I just think that's a, that's a massive piece. Like what I'm hearing there is just environment. Yeah. Like when you're in the right environment, like how, I don't want to use the word say success, but like your likelihood of success becomes so much higher just mm. by placing yourself in the right environment mm. as does if you get it wrong, whether yes. you're hanging around the wrong people or you're hanging around uh, people you know you shouldn't be or you're doing activities that you know you shouldn't be doing or all these things. Um, that's environment. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you can control that. Yeah. Like you get to choose where you putting your attention or putting your time um but yeah environment yeah i think that's shaped by some of these values that you're talking about with discipline hard work all of these things it's uh you're creating this environment that is going to be just like a melting pot for success mm-hmm. um but you've got to stay true to those standards and yeah. if you if you kind of like i guess those standards slip that's when things can kind of get maybe fall out of place a little bit. I think that that's a couple of key things that are important. You've got to stay true to that. Yeah. Standards. <laughs> Managing the, the, the relationship and driving the standards. That's that's key to yeah. key to an environment like a healthy growth inducive environment. Yeah. In yeah. any business, yeah, anywhere, yeah. anywhere that yeah, doesn't anywhere. matter, sport, whatever. Yeah. yeah Um, because as soon as you let those boundaries and standards slip it's just like so many issues can pop up spot fires and then they start to turn to bigger fires if they're not addressed but yeah yeah i think that's that's a key one is coaching changing in any way for you like you've been on the journey for quite a long time is it do you feel like there's a bit of a shift 
Uh, you've been at different levels of coaching. Did you, yeah. Is there any, anything that you're starting to see or change? Uh, I'm not necessarily sure coaching's changing. I think we're becoming more professional as a profession type thing. Like um, I think people are realizing that it's a, maybe or a potential career. <laughs> I, I, I don't laugh at it, but like I've had a lot of people like, oh, you coach full time? Like, like they're surprised that it's like actually my job <laughs> type thing. So I think, um, uh, I yeah, in terms of say coaching changing, I think coaching's progressing in many areas. Um, I think it's becoming more professional. Um, I think it's becoming yeah, like I said, more a more serious type vocation for for people. It's a career path. I I truly believe that. Um, uh, it comes with the game evolving though. Yeah. Because you can I just observe from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, the game has changed yeah. massively. You'd- the players become so much fitter, stronger, faster. Strength and conditioning has gone through the roof. People are really looking after their bodies more. Technology of, of rackets is improving. Um, and people hitting such a good ball and moving out of control. The yeah. athletes that are coming to tennis are just insane now yeah. compared to before. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, I think the sport's in a really ex- like exciting period. Mm. Like I think the sport's in great shape. Like, yeah. and I think the well, the commercialization of the sport I think is going to be huge yeah. over the next five, 10, 20 years. In what way? Where do you see that? Or how, oh. how do you see that unfolding? Oh, I mean, I mean, you look. To, I always look to outside sports. I mean, Theo um, talks about this a lot. Um, but just see what they're doing on the golf tour with that live live, live golf tour. Yeah, yeah. Other sports follow, yeah. you know. Like I'm not. I'm Netflix series, just like Instagram, YouTube, the social media side yeah. is just really popping. The way they market it, you copy it's, what works. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's becoming more exciting, more exciting for people to watch. I think what I observe is they're kind of almost tilt towards mba in a way Mm -hmm. the way um it's marketed is more exciting a lot of exciting players that maybe don't get the best results but get a lot more traction and viewing so obviously like kyrios tiafo um as like these showmen yeah and they're getting a lot more airtime to be like you don't have to be like your roger your rafa your novak yeah well i think that's just athletes now have a greater platform to actually express who they are via social media via all these uh and traditional media too um to actually showcase who they are as a person mm-hmm. um and i think that's enjoyable for these those guys like you know i think they uh a guy like nick or tfo would get a lot of like that's what they want to do they they want to be that guy mm-hmm. um so yeah i think yeah it's exciting for the sport, I think. Yeah, it is exciting. It's heading in a new trajectory. I think people like Alcaraz just we've never seen guys as good in terms of how good he is at that age and how complete he is. And then his coach saying he's probably at like sixty percent. Yeah, of, of what he's capable of. It's like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. No, I don't want to see him at hundred percent. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then just someone like Novak and Nadal, how much they've evolved over their careers, players. Because if I look at them at the same age as Alcaraz, they were so incomplete to what mm-hmm. Alcaraz is at the same age. And I think that's a byproduct of how well people have been coached and how the coaching is getting better and how we're learning more about how the game works mm-hmm. and then how to actually structure proper programs. And I just think about what would happen if someone like LeBron James as an athlete played tennis? Because sports like basketball are they just take those those athletes. Yeah. I just think of what would happen to the game if athletes like that started playing tennis. Yeah. Well, yeah. It'd be t- how how uh, tall is he? Six foot ten or something? Yeah. He plays yeah. seven foot, I reckon. And, yeah. Crazy. I mean, yeah. I mean, really, it, it, it would. And and I'm not just speaking about LeBron, but you would break it down because there's four real components that are that are key to being good at tennis and it's kind of done through Tennis Australia's research. And I think Andrew touched on it in one yeah. of the previous episodes, but um, yeah, power, movement, tennis skills and competitiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, an athlete like that 
you know, if he if he built in developed his tennis skills, then he would be going great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, super exciting. Yeah, but I do think um, uh, I wouldn't be shocked if like coaching becomes more specialized. We've already seen parts of it, but like, you know, as the game grows um, commercially, I think coaching will grow like in line with that. Uh, and I think there's space for like real niche type specialization, like players getting guys coming to work on their transition game and net game and that only. Mm. Um, or just strategy, how um, O'Shaughnessy did some stuff with Djokovic just in that component. I think I wouldn't be shocked to see more of that, like really like, oh, like he's he's working on, you know, my serve and, and, and how I hold serve mm. and this guy's working on how I return and break. Yeah, and, uh, and collaborative as yeah, 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 yeah. a little I, bit more. I'm not, yeah. There's a lot, of, it's tough because it's tough finding coaches that, can collaborate and working with each other but i'm yeah I, I i'm not i wouldn't be shocked if some if that becomes more common yeah yeah, yeah. i mean djokovic has been doing that for a long time yeah, yeah. just bringing guys in federer even did that as well mm -hmm. for specific elements of their game yeah um who was it that helped was it woodford that helped djokovic yeah with his, with his volleys and he's he volleys great now yeah compared to how he used to volley definitely like a massive change yeah Mm, and it's cool to see that there's holes in the guy's game that are still at the most elite level. And it's cool to see how they transition and progress and know that they're working on it too. Yeah. And that's what's necessary if you want to go to the absolute highest levels. You've got to be complete in every way. And yeah. then throw in, the, throw in the mindset element of just being an absolute specimen upstairs. Yeah. Well, the mindset like, element. <laughs> <laughs> We've been going for a little while now. We're gonna we're gonna tuck in, are we? <laughs> the mindset element is. I just want to touch because I yeah. worked on a lot of strength uh, work with a lot of strength and conditioning coaches over the years, and um, the more experienced type strength and conditioning coach has gravitated towards actually wanting to get the mindset right. So there was, and I and I. Uh, a younger type strength and conditioning coach that uh, was working with one of my athletes and he just wanted to really delve into what he what his role was strength and conditioning yeah. but a lot of the more experienced strength and conditioning coaches i've worked with have been fascinated with the mind and i think that speaks to that, that speaks to a lot mm -hmm. and in terms of for me like I, the way i'm interpreting that is like we can have the body right we can have the body strong you can be fast but if you're not good here like my work, my work's rendered useless. Yeah, it's so true, man. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So like I'm seeing these like really like top level strength and conditioning coaches and they're like, can we do some stuff in the mind? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's important, man. It's the direction that I've gone a lot more in to go like, if we can't get some, some core beliefs or patterning going on or getting that right that's happening mentally, internally, we can't really move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And once you start to understand the athlete and, and their mental processes, you can tap into that. And I feel like the results come really easily once you start to, yeah, really get some things clicking in that space. Yeah. That could be a podcast in itself. Yeah. yeah maybe, another, maybe another time when you're <laughs> probably back around Adelaide in some point. Who knows when? Who knows when? But um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably, I'm pretty happy to leave it there. I think yep. we've, we've had a pretty solid, robust discussion around coaching and um it's really cool to see the journey that you're on and the places you're going and where it's leading you and, and then it's just filtering back to to us uh, on the ground here at ata and i feel like i'm getting a sick apprenticeship from you learning about all of these things and i get to use you, you as a soundboard to really understand a few things and it just comes from experience really like you you're continually experienced you're open to learning you're continually growing and it means that we all kind of benefit and, and work as a team and i think that's a sign of any healthy business is still having connection like you said early really initially in the chat close connection to the founder really trying to be a sponge 
and uh, yeah, be on the same team to to work towards a vision. I feel like we're uh, yeah, you're helping us out a lot in that space. So yeah, super grateful, bro. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, Good. loved it, man. And uh, yeah, we keeping tabs from afar. Um, but wishing you nothing but the best, bro. Thanks, man. Cheers.